Hey, thanks for the invitation. Thanks to, to our organizers. So obviously, obviously everybody's liking this idea. Um, I didn't quite know what to do when with this uh, request. So I thought it'd be fun to talk about something, that, a problem that everybody's probably heard of um, back in the day, perhaps. Um, and some recent work that I've been doing with George Shaken at, at Oxford University. So the Frobenius postage stamp problem is, um, well, the simple example is the post office has an unlimited supply of three and five cents stamps, but due to the current crisis, they're unable to get any other denomination of stamps. So what exact postages can you pay with some combination of those two stamps? So the smallest amount you can pay zero. Um, but after that, well, you obviously can't pay one or two cents. You can pay three cents. Four cents, you can't pay five. You can. Six. But seven, there's no obvious combination. And if you just keep on going, you find, well, here's the list. And um, now, hold on. I want to see if I can get a uh, um, cursor I can use. Um, Oh, there is a way, but I'm not seeing it. Anyway, let me, oh, can you see my cursor? Yes. Oh, you can, okay, great. So I didn't need to even ask it. Um, okay, so what we see is that at eight cents, um, we start finding many combinations of three and five cent stamps, and it seems to go on. And then if you had actually worked it out yourself, which you may have done so, um, you'll notice that there's a pattern here that going from eight cents to 11 cents, the difference seems to be just add another three cent stamp. So, um, in fact, we can go from eight, nine, 10 and add another three cent stamp each time and get 11, 12, 13. And then we can proceed by induction and obtain any integer greater than or equal to eight. I don't know if that was too fast, but pretty trivial mathematics. We just add three cents add it again and add it again. So what this means is that we can get any integer number greater than or equal to eight as the any combination of three and five seven stamps just by starting with eight, nine, 10 and adding on three cent stamps. So what's the proof concept? You, you cover each congruence class mod three and then you keep on adding multiples of three. So um, what we saw on the previous um, slide was that you can cover every non-negative integer except one, two, and four, and seven. So this is an exceptional set, the, the numbers you can't represent as linear, positive linear combination or non-negative linear combination of three and five. So try and keep these numbers one, two, four, and seven in mind. We'll keep on coming back to this example. Okay, so um, let's try and generalize this idea. Given A and B sense stamps, what is the set AM plus BN, obviously it's really a little number theory problem where we're just taking positive integer or non-negative integer linear combinations of the positive integers A and B. So I'm gonna call PAB my set of numbers that are represented as positive linear combinations of A and B. And one, it's not hard to see that if G divides A and B, we can just divide it out and we'll get G times what happens if you add A over G and B over G. So for that reason, we'll just assume without any loss of generality that A and B have GCD one. And so what was the idea with three and five? We, we wanted an element of each congruence class mod three. And well, I'm not gonna do it exactly the same way as before. I'm just now, I'm just gonna say, what's the minimum number we can represent in each congruence class mod three? Now, maybe what I should have said is if I've got up here, if I've got three times n plus five times n, and I want to think about that mod three, the three times n is irrelevant. It's just the five times something that's relevant. So to get the minimum numbers, you just do zero times five, one times five, and two times five, and that'll get you the minimum representative in each congruence class mod three. So, how do, what integers do we, can we represent as non-negative linear combinations of three and five? Well, we take that zero times five and we can add on any multiple of three, the two times five and then add on any multiple of three and the one times five. And that's the set of integers represented. So 
what integers are, are missing in each of those congruence classes? Well, here we started at zero. So obviously nothing's missing. Here we started, let me start here. Here we started five. So what numbers are missing that are two mod three? Well, just two. And here we're looking at the numbers that are one mod five and we started at 10. So the numbers missing are one, four, and seven. So you see the exceptional set appearing one, two, four, seven. And this is kind of a uh, perhaps more logical way to go about constructing it. So we could also do it the other way around. We could have started with mod five and look at the smallest number in each congruence class mod five, which are zero through four times three. And the numbers missing in each congruence class, and you see again, it's one, two, four, and seven. So here's two different ways of coming to the exceptional set um, in a way that generalizes. So here's the general idea. We've got A and B, which are co-prime. And we're gonna look at the smallest representatives in each congruence class mod B. These are just the multiples of A. Then the multiples from zero and B minus one. And then the numbers that are represented are those multiples plus any multiple, non-negative multiple of B. So what's missing? What's the exceptional set? So I'm gonna write, so I'm gonna write notation. We get all the non-negative integers minus some finite exceptional set. And what is the finite exceptional set? You take each of these arithmetic progressions mod B and you look at all the numbers that are less than M times A. So this is what's represented. And then what isn't represented, just like in the example up here, is the numbers that are smaller than n times a in that arithmetic progression. So what's nice is we can see it's a finite set. If you want, you can count the number of elements of a set and do various things. So there's all sorts of history of this problem. Um, but I want to bring in a modern twist on this whole problem. So perhaps I should have said one of my motivations for working this problem is that it's an old problem. But there's a new subject of additive combinatorics, which is very interesting in adding things together um, and looking at the structure, but with some control. And it's all about structure. So let me give a modern twist on this old problem. So in the list of uh, representations I gave up to 13, there was a unique way of representing each number. But once you get to 15, you could place five three cent stamps or three five cent stamps on your envelope and both would get you to 15 cents. So the question is, which is the better choice? So given that we're all trying, that, well, there's been so much less emissions, thanks to nobody moving around, and we want a green world. The hint was, I guess, in the uh, color there. Um, to save a planet, we want to use less stamps. So the choice is that 15 cents is three five cent stamps. Another Perhaps reason you might want less stamps is your envelope's only a certain size. And if all your stamps are the same size, then you want fewer stamps. So what we're gonna be interested in is not just what can be represented with three and five cent stamps, but if you've only allowed to put 20 stamps on the face of your envelope, what numbers can you represent by a combination of three and five cent stamps? So I wanna do a slightly strange thing. So I'm going to look at n times my set, this is the sort of notation for n times the set, where uh, what I'm going to do is allow m and n, m times three, time, and n times five, m and n going up to capital N, and whatever's left over, I'm going to say it's a multiple of zero. This is very convenient because I can just write everything as L times zero, three times m, five times n, where the sum of these coefficients is capital N. So um, here, the set A is all combinations of zero, three, and five, and I'm multiplying, I'm, I'm adding a set to itself n times. So what we've seen is that for this set, the exceptional set is one, two, four, and seven. And what I wanna do is understand what n times A looks like for n is one, two, three, four, et cetera. So let's just do a calculation. So two times A, it looks, there's not much structure to be seen in here. Three times the set, so I'm just taking some linear combination of three of these guys, maybe of repetitions. This is what I get, which, well, we start to see in the middle there, the eight, nine, 10, 11 that we saw before, right? We're just missing, down this end, we're missing the one, two, four, and seven. We get the stuff in the middle, and then we're missing a couple of numbers at the end. So that's what three times A looks like. It's everything you'd expect. Well. You couldn't, with three stamps, you can't go to bigger than three times five. 
So the range for three times a is zero to 15. And what we're interested in here is what's missing. So if I look at four times a, I see in the middle here, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, uh, oh, that's a typo, the 14. Sorry, I should have put that in. Um, and we're just missing 17 and 19 at the end, and the one, two, four, and seven here. So already we're starting to see a structure that three times a and four times a, they're missing the exceptional set for a, and they're missing a couple of numbers at the end, and just two. So let me just make the observation that since we can add zero, if I take three stamps, that's going to be a subset of four stamps because I could have just added zero. And so these are nested sets, and they're all, the end set is always between the integers between zero and five n, and we're missing some. Okay, so what we're going to be interested in is take this set, subtract n times a, and what are we missing? We know we're missing the exceptional set at the beginning, but what we've seen in these, at least so far when we've done the calculations, is there's two integers missing at the end. So let's just continue looking. Um, 4a is in 5a. And what I'm going to do is take a bunch of elements and add 5, which will be the new elements I can get in 5a. And then when I do that, I mean, you can verify it if you like. Um, you can see I get every number between 0 and 25, except 22 and 24, which you'll notice are just five more than these two numbers. So a pattern is emerging. And in fact, just this proof of picking these numbers for the next one, I just do 17, 19, uh, 21, 23, and 25, and add five. Um, by induction, one's able to prove that you get everything between 0 and 5n. You're missing the exceptional set at the beginning that we know can never be represented as linear combinations in 0, 3, and 5. But somehow we're always missing two numbers at the end. So what, ear, what are the, oh, the other thing I should say is that if you think about 0, 3, and 5, or 0, let's look at this one. It's missing 1, 2, 4, and 7. And let's think, 5n minus 1 would be 9. 5n minus 3 would be 7. It's also missing 7 and 9. So it's not just for n greater than or to 3. These are also set minus these, it's just that there's some overlap between these two sets. So for all n greater than or equal to 1, this is true, easily proved. And um, the next question is really, can we understand what on earth, why minus 1 and minus 3? So we have to do a little calculation here. And that's simply what we're going to do is, and this is partly why we formulated things the way we did, is we want to look from the other end, from the 5n end of what's going on. So if I have a number between 0 and 5n, and I write it as l times 0 and m times 3 and 5 times m, with l plus m plus n equal to capital N, then what I'm going to do is look at 5n minus k, and then, well, straightforward enough calculation, just a little linear algebra. But here's the beautiful thing. It ends up 5n minus k is just like n times 0 plus n times 2 plus l times 5. So it's a linear combination of, well, n numbers, l plus n plus n is n, but now with the set 0, 2, and 5. And what do you think the exceptional set is for 0, 2, and 5? What numbers aren't represented? Well, it's actually easy to see because um, we just have to look mod 2, right? We just have to look at congruence classes. Now, 0 is represented, so 0, 2, 4, et cetera, represented. What's the smallest odd number? It's 5. So the only odd numbers missing are 1 and 3. So there's a proof that that's the exceptional set. And well, in the notation we're going to use, 5 minus our original set is 0, 2, 5. That's just the calculation we did up here. So what we've proved is that this 5n minus 3, 5n minus 1 is, well, 5n minus the set 1, 3, which is 5n minus this exceptional set, which is, and what is this ex exceptional set? It's just 5 minus a. So what we see is that um, for this set A035, the number of the set of integers represented by n, a linear combination of um, n numbers from the set A, is all the numbers between five, 0 and 5n minus an exceptional set for A and an exceptional set that appears from the other end. So, yeah, so that's cute. Um, but here's the thing, this is kind of where, where we're sort of in the modern um, 
formulation of additive is that you see structure. That's one of the beautiful things. Add the set of integers to itself enough times, structure appears. And here the structure is you have a whole interval except some very understandable endpoints. So the, um, the general theorem is for any set of three elements, so two stamps and zero, which are co-prime, you get, well, here I'm going to have my numbers be zero, A, and B. We get all the numbers between zero and B times capital N. And the only things that are missing are the exceptional set, which we, we proved early on was finite at this end, and then the exceptional at, at set at the other end. That's all that's missing. Now, um, the funny thing is actually that although this has been reproved many times in literature, it seems this, this is the first time to note that actually this actually works for all n greater than or equal to one. So it's always true that you get n times a is exactly this. So question, can we generalize this to a larger set of stamps? And well, okay, what am I saying generalize? Can we generalize the structure theorem? And well, here I'm just being very specific about is it true for all n greater than or equal to one, this new theorem. So if I just take the set of stamps one, nine, and 10, then we can see the exceptions, right? Because I can just add one to itself as many times and get every integer. And when I look at 10 minus a, well, it's the same set. So there's no exceptions for 10 minus a. So um, given that's the case, we note that one, if, if this above theorem was true, A would represent every number between zero and 10, but it doesn't. We're gonna to have to wait a while before a multiple of A represents eight, for instance. So let's just try, we're gonna to have to search for the correct generalization. In this example, we can see eight would be represented by eight times a set, because it's like eight times one, but it doesn't appear in seven times a set. I'm more Generally, if A was 0, 1, B minus 1, B, then B minus 2, so the equivalent of 8 in this example, appears here, but it doesn't appear in the set before. So the best we could hope for here, in, if we're going to generalize to arbitrarily large sets, is N bigger than B minus 2. So that's going to be our first goal in this talk. Um, and well, OK, the, the goal is, is just proof for sufficiently large to start off with. So we saw if A has three elements, then we get, it starts at one. Um, and there are A's for which we have to go from B minus two. And here's the correct generalization. A set of K plus two elements, between them they're co-prime, everything can be represented. So we can proceed by four. We can just simply, um, so it turns out the most convenient thing to do is to split into the integers modulo the largest number here, B, and to take um, the linear combinations in here, we're going to do exactly the same thing. We're going to look at the minimal number represented each arithmetic progression and then add multiples of B to that. That's kind of the idea. So let me just formalize some notation. Unfortunately, we're going to have to have a slightly complicated notation. So for my set A, I'm going to look at the numbers that are represented as linear combinations of elements like non-negative linear combinations. And remember, B was the largest element in my set A. And I'm going to look at the smallest number in the arithmetic progression, A mod B, that is represented. And what we know is if you represent this number, then you can add B to it as many times as you like. So every number in that arithmetic progression that's at least as big as this is represented. So the exceptional set is just going to be the union of the numbers in those arithmetic progressions that are smaller than this minimal element. So I'm going to try and prove a theorem that things work when you're sufficiently large. So what I want to do is look at ends in this arithmetic progression that are bigger than the minimum represented here and smaller than, well, if I look at NB minus N, if I go to the other end, this is the corresponding number, right? The smallest number represented in the arithmetic progression minus A mod B by the set B minus capital A. And actually, there's, what's going to make that very easy is there's an induction argument that works. So if, an, if this interval is represented for n, then the interval, the corresponding interval is represented with n plus 1 because you just add b to the largest element here and you get the largest element here. Couldn't be easier. So induction works 
So we just have to find the first, the first capital N where this works, and then all the subsequent capital N we've got the theorem for. Okay, so here I'm just going to give you, it's a little bit, in, uh, a little bit um, notation prone this proof, but um, it's not hard. So I'm going to take capital N where I'm going to start my induction to be the sum of these two numbers. What are these numbers? Well, I defined the um, smallest number represented in each arithmetic progression mod B, and I need to know what's the first time it appears, what's the smallest capital N in which it appears in each of those arithmetic progressions. So that's this number, capital N, A comma A. And so I'm going to prove for this number that everything in our interval is represented. And the trick is I'm going to look at whether I can represent N or the number at the, from, I'm gonna try and represent it from the other end if you like. And this sums obviously to B times N. And then because capital N is this thing, I can say that's actually an equal sign. So what that means is that N is either less than this, or this is less than that, less than or equal to, right? Otherwise, we'd have a problem. So I'll just work with this one. This is the same argument, just a little bit more complicated. So remember I said N was the starting point in the arithmetic progressions plus some multiple of B. The multiple of B here is nicely bounded just by this inequality. Therefore, when I try and get my number n, it's the starting point plus k times b. The starting point we know is in that multiple of a. We just proved that that many b's are in here. And so n is in n times a. That was it. It's not a hard proof. longer. So it's just the start of the induction. On the previous slide, I showed there is an induction, but once you got it for capital N, you got it for capital N plus one. And so what if we proved? We've proved that we do get our structure. So if we've got a set of integers that are co-prime, so that we can represent every integer by some linear combination, positive or negative, that if we look at N times the set, where we only do positive linear combination, but non-negative linear combination, no more than what's exactly at the end of them, then we all the numbers will be in zero and b times n minus the two obvious exceptional sets. Once n is sufficiently large, and this is what sufficiently large means. Okay, so this is not, I've got a compute, all sort of secondary um, things. So let's try and understand that a little better. Can we be a little more explicit about this bound on capital N, it's lower bound? So what I want to do is I want to show that, I want to get some bound on these terms. And let's just think about definition. It said that um, I'll take the minimum number represented in arithmetic progression A mod B, and I'll write it as a sum of elements from my set. Oh, these subscripts are not the same as those. Forgive me for that. Um, so these are, this is a representation by elements from the set A, and um, the, this capital N is the fewest summons. So here's my claim that the fewest summons is no more than B. In fact, no more than B minus one, in fact. So why is that? What would happen if, if the fewest summons was greater than B? The pigeonhole principle. So does that work? As argument is a1 to an, where n is greater than b, then I can just look at these numbers, 0, a1, a1 plus a2, a1 plus a2 plus a3, etc., telescoping all the way. And I've got b plus 1 different objects here. So two of them are congruent mod b. So if I just take the difference of the two that are congruent mod b, say it's the jth one and the i minus first one, then I get some sum like this, which is congruent to zero mod b. And what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna subtract it from this total sum. So I, there's sub sum, there is some sub sum, of, which is zero mod b. I take it out. If I take it out, then this sum with that deleted is the same as the original sum, which is congruent to a mod b, but this is a smaller sum. 
I've used less elements, and that contradicted the minimality. So, if we have a sum that's too long, we can simply erase any subsum that's zero mod p. That's, I mean, that's a sort of a general idea that if you've got a minimal sum that's a mod p, you can't have a subsum that's zero mod p. So, with this, we're able to say that each of these numbers are less than b, less than or equal b, and so this bound here is 2b, a worse 2b. But can we do better? We knew that in the set 0, 1, b minus 1, that was the sort of worst case we had was b minus 2, not 2b. And in this particular case, where we know that one of these numbers can be large, it's feasible that the other one isn't. It's feasible that this being large forces this to be small. That if we can understand when one of these numbers is large, maybe that structure will allow us to say something about this one coming from the other direction. So again, here's the idea. We're going, so now I'm going to just suppose, instead of saying up to B, I'm going to suppose that one of these sums has got more than B over two elements. That's not true. The two things add together to less than B, and I've got what I want. So let's just suppose that we've got some minimal subsum that's A mod B, and that um, total is that there's more than B over two elements. And um, there's no subsum that's zero mod B. So um, I'm going to add one element to make life a little bit more pretty, which is just B minus A. So now I'll get a sum of n plus one elements at zero mod B with no subsum being zero mod B. Again, if a subsum here is zero mod B, then its complement is zero mod B, and one of those would be a subsum of this. So um, this is sort of a, an interesting little combinatorics problem, mod, mod B. You have a large number of numbers, mod B, more than B over two of them. There's sum is zero mod B, and no sum is it, subsum is zero mod B. So you can sort of ask yourself, how do we do that? Well, one idea would just be to take positive integers, all of which are less than or equal to, which sum up to B. So by taking positive integers that sum to B, all of them must be um, less than B. So no subsum could be B. So that's a pretty easy construction of a set of integers that sum to zero, a big set of integers that sum to zero mod B with no subsum being zero mod B. So the question is, are there any other possibilities? So, oops, let me just talk, I thought I had another thing there. Let me just talk about, how about just taking a sum being two times B? So I've got a lot of integers summed together, um, it's like say two thirds of B, and their sum is two times B. Well, um, it could be a whole mixture of integers, but, if I have, if it's two thirds B, there's probably going to be a bunch of one, twos, and threes, right, amongst them. And if I've got a bunch of one, twos, and threes, then we can take subsums of those and sort of cover little intervals. So as we sort of move up towards B, it will be hard not to cover the number B itself by a subsum. So one way to avoid it would be perhaps to take each number AI to be two or something like that, except maybe A zero. Now, you've got to be a little bit careful because if B was even, you would hit um, B. But for instance, if I took the sum A0 plus A1 up to AN to be 2B and all of them were 2 and B was odd, that would work. And in fact, that's the only other possible type of example. So there's this wonderful theorem by Savchev and Chen in a theorem in the, in the journal number, in a paper in journal number theory. It's a combination of several papers. Um, and they prove that if you do have a sum that's zero mod B with no proper sum, sum being zero, and there's more than B over two elements in this sum, B over two plus one elements, then you actually, what really is underlying it is you have a bunch of integers that sum up to B, which are positive integers, and then the A is just some multiple of those mod B. That's the trick. So obviously if a subsum of the AJs with zero mod B, the corresponding subsum here of the CJs will be zero mod B. So you can see this construction works, but what's amazing is this is the only possible construction. And in fact, Savchev and Chen went down to B over three, um, but it's very complicated. And it's a, it's a subject that's crying out for, for more people to work in it. I think there's a lot 
to be done here that would be very beautiful to understand such terms. So, um, yeah, so using this, it wasn't hard. I mean, just one of these sort of annoying chasing around arguments, but it wasn't particularly hard to prove that we actually do get that n times a is what you guess, is always what you guess, all the instant b and n minus the obvious exceptional sets when n is bigger than two times the integer part of b over two. And let's just see how that compares. This means that we can take, this number is gonna be b minus one or b, as b is odd or even. And our conjecture was b minus two. So we just failed to prove the conjecture that, that you know, b minus two would be best possible if it's doable, if it's correct. And we just failed to get it. And okay, I, we certainly believe that b minus two is correct. The problem is that as soon as you go to b, the sub sum, a sum of size b over two, the sum is zero and has no proper subsums being zero mod b, then you've got in Savchev and Chen, they point out there are lots of new cases. So one has to go through all those cases very carefully. And it's, you know, it's a, it's a nice starter problem for a PhD maybe, is to actually prove that this is the right answer by chasing through all those cases. What might be true in general is that you could do slightly better depending on the size of the set E, that perhaps this number NA should be B plus two minus the size of the set. And here's an example where you get equality. So in our example, zero, one, B minus one, B, A was four, that's why we got B minus two, and this might be the best we can do in general. Okay, so that's what happens in, um, if you've got an arbitrary set of postage stamps and you want to do N of them, then we have an exact structure theorem from some point onwards. And again, what I should say is in literature, something like this is proof for N from some point onwards. For us, the main interest is to getting the correct, as good a bound as possible here. So what I want to do now is say, well, let's try and think about this in higher dimensions. So here, kind of a very elementary problem. You just get a set of positive integers. You're looking at all the linear combination as positive or non-negative integers. Now I want to move to Z to the end, but let's just focus on Z squared because we can kind of formulate the problem in two dimensions and the formulation works in a higher dimension. So, um, why did, why did we start the set at zero? Well, you know, translation is not, is not a big deal when you're doing additive things, right? So it makes sense to start with zero and similarly in higher dimension, we're gonna start with the point zero, zero. In the next thing that we, we did in, in one dimension is to have the GCD of all the integers being one. What was the reason for that? Well, the reason was that if you look at all the linear combinations, positive or negative, of those integers, you would get a whole of Z. It wouldn't be, you know, you wouldn't be barred by some congruence condition. So if we're gonna to go to high dimension or two dimensions, what we'll insist on is when you take all of the linear combinations of the set, positive and negative, you get the whole of Z squared. So that's the natural generalization. And then another thing that happened was we, we said if A is a subset of, of or goes from zero to B, and it's some subset of the integers and in including zero and B, then N times A is a subset of the, the integers between zero and N times B. And the reason was that zero to B is actually the convex hull of the points in A. So if we're gonna generalize the higher dimension, we wanna do the same thing. So, you know, it's fairly standard, the convex hull is you take the elements of A, you take all the linear combinations, non-negative linear combinations, where the coefficients sum to one, and that's your convex hull. And then it's clear that N times the set, these set of points in A, this finite subset of Z squared, belongs to N times the convex hull. <clears throat> and it's gonna be convenient for us to, um, to take that hull to infinity. So um, what is sort of the, 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 the lattice points that could be represented by um, non-negative linear combinations in, <clears throat> because look, when we worked in Z, um, we, we just had the integers greater than or equal to zero. We, we cut out the inches less than zero. We had a ray in one direction. So in two dimensions, we're gonna have some sort of cone. We might have a lattice point here, a lattice point here. You can see my picture. 
And we might have some in between, but if we take the convex hull, we just go out from the convex hull. Okay, so that's going to be a convenient notation. So in two dimensions, we're asking you to find that subset of Z squared. It, it, um, if you look at it, what it generates over Z, it generates all of Z squared. Um, it includes zero, zero. And we're going to ask for representation inside the convex hull. So um, oh, this is just saying what we had on the last slide. And again, what we're going to, well, firstly, we're going to say if we take n times a, what is the set of everything that's represented? And by some linear combination of elements of a, and we're going to have an exceptional set, which is take everything in the cone. So that's everything that could feasibly be represented and remove the ones that are represented in that sort of exceptional set. So just the analogy to what happens in one dimension. So first question, is the exceptional set from that? We saw it was in one dimension. Um, that was one, two, four, seven, if you remember. In our original case. And if we're going to formulate the theorem, we pro probably need to understand what happens when you go to the far end and take off the exceptional set. OK, let me start with the exceptional sets. So B minus A, what was that? Well, I didn't sort of say it when we worked with it, but what we were sort of doing was recalibrating. Instead of sort of starting from zero and looking at the set going towards B, we were starting at B, making that kind of a zero and looking in the other direction. So B minus A is like a recalibration. It's moving where your, your perspective to that, um, that vertex on the convex hull. So what makes sense in a generalization is to look at for each A and A, the set little a minus capital A, and that's the perspective from that um, element of a convex hull. So we'll be looking in that direction. And that gives us the um, guess that n times the set will be the z squared lattice points in n times the convex hull minus these exceptional sets. If n sufficiently large, that would be the thing you'd naturally conjecture to be the right theorem now. So um, let's try an example. So, um, okay, so I had two options. One was to try and get LaTeX to print more than 400 dots. And I figured the amount of time myself of dotting my graph paper is going to be considerably less. So here it is. Um, I'm sure some of you will write to me, tell me how I could have done in a second. But anyway, so anyway, here's the, um, the set I'm going to use. So we've got zero, zero, we've got two, zero, we've got three, zero. So the convex hull will be just the positive quadrant, right? Because we've got things sticking out in that direction. And I've just thrown in one more element, which is one, one. So we're going to take everything in the positive quadrant and one can, well, you just run the computer or you just get your handsaw and you quickly find out this is what's represented. And what can we see? Well, it's pretty much filled in here, right? And if we look along here, just at the start, there's some exceptions down here and there's some exceptions up there. So again, we're taking all non-negative linear combinations of these, these vectors and we're looking at what's represented and what isn't. And what we see is there seems to be things not represented close into the boundary here and close into the boundary here, but it looks like there's a pattern. So this will probably go on to infinity. So it doesn't look, it looks like the exceptional set is no longer finite. So what we're gonna to have to do is understand the exceptional set if we're gonna make any progress. And we also wanna prove that basically the exceptional set's only near the boundary, that something's, that here in the middle, life's easy. So how did we manage that in one dimension? We said, well, um, when we worked in mod three, we looked at the numbers, the smallest numbers represented mod three, and then we just added multiples of three. So what we're gonna to want to do is look at all of Z squared, and if we're gonna use the same argument, do some modular arithmetic. Well, modular arithmetic in Z squared, you've got to mod by a sublattice. And so we'll look at the sublattice generated by two, zero, and zero, three. So if we think about that, look, we've got, if you can follow my cursor, we're representing four, three, five, three, four, four, five, four, these things here, right? This little six tuple here. And I can add to them two zero to get to this six tuple here. I can add again two zero to get to this six tuple here. 
And alternatively, I could start again here and add 0, 3 and get to this six tuple here and this six tuple here, and then zigzag my way up to infinity. So, oops. So here's the plan. I start with that, and I add two zeros and I add zero three. And what I've really done is I've added non-negative linear combinations of two zero zero three to a set of representatives of z squared modulo the sub lattice, <clears throat> and that gives me everything up there. So what I've proved is that everything that's not represented in this case is close to one of the boundaries. It's this uh, chunk here. We're done. So let's be a little more explicit about the exceptional set. If we just instead, so this is, I took the graph I had before and I put a cross where the number was missing. And let's just have a look. If I go down here, it's pretty clear. You can just see that everything's spaced by a two zero, right? So there are three arithmetic progressions here spaced by a two zero. And if I look up here, it's a little more tricky to see out here. You can see the zero three spacing. The next line down, you can see the zero three spacing. Here we've got two missing guys. But then you add zero, three, and there are two missing guys, two missing guys, et cetera. So the exceptional set is nine arithmetic progressions where we've got a common difference which corresponds to the vector that defines the boundary. So this is it, just written out. And well, our surprise is that the exceptional set is some finite, but it is a finite union of one dimensional objects. <coughs> So this is being a little more explicit. And so our exceptional set on the, is in fact the finite union of sets of form a vector, a starting point, plus P of B, where B has one element other than zero, zero. This is in dimension two. So if we go to dimension M, we have the same kind of general theorem. So we have the same uh, hypothesis. A represents everything, um, clue zero. Then when you take n times A, you get everything inside the convex tell minus these exceptional sets, so the sets that go to infinity. Those are the only things missing from some point onwards. So unfortunately, our proof is inexplicit. I'll explain very briefly why it's inexplicit in a minute. But um, so that's a bad part of the proof. A good part is we can determine the general structure of a set A. I'll explain also, we can be explicit in certain cases. So there's work to be done here. So this structure of exceptional set in general is that it's a starting point plus the numbers represented by some subset of A, where the subset is, well, the elements that subset, in fact, I should have said they're all linearly independent of one another. It contains n minus one element, so it's less than the dimension here. And b was a subset of a. So just like we saw in the example, that's what the exceptional set always looks like. In general, you can prove that the exceptional set always stays a bounded distance away from the boundary of n times the hull. This was proved in the in some cases in a very different context by Simpson and Tideman in 2003. And um, a corollary of what we've done um, is a surprising theorem of Kavansky is that once you get to a sufficiently large point, you can always write the number of points inside um, n times a as a polynomial in this capital N of degree the number of elements in a, sorry, the degree um, the dimension. That you're working with. And this in 1992 was a um, big, so it was in real algebraic geometry. So, this sort of idea of, well, they're talking about counting points and polytopes, um, comes up in different fields. And Kavansky proved this, as I say, in 1992. It was quite a fuss in his area. And his proof was a little bit different from us. So, what he did um, is construct a finitely generated graded module over C extended by. Um, k variables, where k is the size of a set A. Each, so m1, m2 is the finely generated graded module. Each of these m, mn's was a vector space over complex numbers of dimension n times A. And there's a theorem of Hilbert that allowed him to prove that if n is sufficiently large, these elements of a graded modules, um, sorry, n times A was the dimension of this space. 
And the theorem of Hilbert allowed him to show that the number of points inside that, that module would be, or the dimension would be, a polynomial in it. So I have no idea really what I just said. I'm just reading it out. But um, yeah, there are very different proofs in this world. The problem, I mean, there are many problems with this proof in terms of you know, how much you can get your hands on things. Um, subsequently, in about 2000, Nathanson generalized it to a more combinatorial look. And then together with Ruzsa, they used essentially elementary ideas to prove the same theorem. Um, they, it's a little different because they didn't need to access all the structure in order to prove this theorem. Um, so there's, there's more in what we've done because we have all the structure. Um, so what is this, this polynomial? Um, it's rather mysterious. I don't know if you've, you've tried to use Erhardt polynomials. So, you've got some shape elegant corners on lattice points and you try and, and count the number of points inside there is a polynomial that will tell you um, and this polynomial um, and the first few are obvious like the top coefficients the volume right the number of lattice points inside the shape the next is to do with the volume of the um, sides one dimension down the third coefficient you not only have the volume of the n minus two dimensional sides, but you've got to take account of the angle between those sides. And it's, they're just mysterious. I mean, how to compute them, how to really understand them is very hard. So in terms of actually writing down these co the coefficients of polynomial, it's very tricky. So strangely, we can have a fairly um, explicit description of what this thing looks like, but we struggle to count because of the difficulty of constructing coefficients of such polynomials. So I'll just say a couple of the tools we use. So there's a beautiful theorem by Harith Yederoy, um, better known for complex analysis. And what we break this down to is if we have this set A, then what Harith Yederoy's theorem says is if you have a vector inside this convex hull, then um, you have a linearly independent subset of size n plus one, which um, V is inside that convex hull. If you, I should have written this as convex hulls. So um, we can, instead of looking at some arbitrary set, we can break it down into um, sets with, um, which are linearly independent. So a bit like when we're working mod B before, we only need to think about the elements zero and B. Once we've filled in the inside, we're able to do that in higher dimension, but there you have, it's a little more tricky to include everything. So we needed this theorem that Carathy Ederoy had needed. Another interesting theorem that we use is um, by, um, well, I first learned of it in, the, in a famous combinatorial number theory paper of Mann, but the algebraic geometers know of a, of a, a theorem of, that this was proved by Dixon sometime earlier. It's funny how the same ideas proliferate in different directions. So here we're going to take numbers in Rn and we have a partial ordering on them, which is that A is less than B if the, all the coefficients of A are less than or equal to all the coefficients of B. And if we have some subset of all of the numbers with coefficients all greater than or equal to zero, what the finite basis lemma says, find a finite such that everything in our original set is greater than or equal to something in the finite subset. Okay, so, um, rather beautiful theorem. You just have some arbitrary set of points with non-negative coefficients, and there is some subset of that set which is less than or equal to every element of the set. So it's a beautiful theorem and, and really key to what we're doing. And the problem is you can see it's, it's not explicit. It's just there exists a finite subset, and the proof's a little hard to do anything terribly explicit. Um, So, yeah, maybe that is one um, get to the um, a description of what, what's missing. And so this tells us something, but what we want is what's not included. And then you can kind of revisit this lemma and look at it from the other direction. And you can get an explicit description of what vectors aren't in there. So let me just finish by saying um, 
we have this problem that of inexplicitness that we'd like to understand, that we'd like to do better than. Um, what isn't hard to, what, so, but we had these theorems in, in one dimension where we just had a three element set and we were able to just say for n greater than or equal to one, you get exactly this structure from the start. So can one generalize that, that same argument to higher dimension? And um, the trick actually is that you can do it if in um, n dimensions you take a set of size n plus two, including zero, zero. And it has to also have this property that, um, that there is a convex hull and the one other point is inside the convex hull. So, um, there are cases in which we make it explicit. This, the new, this is actually new and is not on the archive preprint, but will be at some point when we decide we're done. Um, so let me leave it there. Okay. Well, thanks. Okay. Thanks very much, Andrew. Thank you. Um, we could all unmute and clap, for example, to thank. Oh my God. Yourself. Sound like 203 people. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to stop stop recording now, and then we can ask the questions after. Okay, three, two, one. I'm stopped.